Welcome to the second day of the first annual symposium for the C3 AI Digital Transformation Institute. This is a multi-institutional organization with funding and support from both Microsoft and C3 AI. Today, the second day, we are beginning with a keynote speaker, Martha Palmer. I have to say I'm delighted to introduce Martha because we were colleagues together at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, a brief bio sketch. She is the Helen and Hubert Croft Professor for Computer Science and the Arts and Sciences Professor of Distinction for Linguistics at the University of Colorado. She has more than 250 peer reviewed publications. She's an elected fellow of the ACL and the AAAI and has had several noteworthy leadership positions. Specifically, she is the former president of the Association of Computational Linguistics which is the major society for computational linguistics researchers in computer science. She is a co-director of the Center for Computational Language and Education Research, otherwise known as CLEAR, which is dedicated to advancing human language technology and applying it to personalized learning. And she notes that the National Academy of Engineering has identified personalized learning as one of the 14 grand challenges for the 21st century. In addition, she is a co-PI on one of the recently awarded NSF National AI Institutes and her institute focuses on student AI teaming. Martha, we're delighted to have you and I'd like you to begin your talk. Thank you very much for the invitation to talk to this August Institute. And Tandy, thank you for that kind introduction. I also share fond memories of some of our time together at Penn. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you today about uh, what we're our new project that we're working on, AI Partners in the Classroom, Challenges and Opportunities. Oh, sorry, there's the phone ringing in the back. Um, our, the, we are asking ourselves, how can we best promote deep conceptual learning via rich socio-collaborative learning experiences for all students? And our vision for doing this is to have AI partners partnering with each breakout group. When a teacher has, has brought the classroom together on a particular topic, the students have come up with questions and then she has broken them up into maybe eight or 10, two to three student breakout groups to discuss these questions. Educators today are very convinced that the more a student can control their learning experience, the more they can articulate their questions and their possible solutions to those questions, the better they will learn and the more they will retain that information. Those of you who are university educators will know how important this notion of breakout groups is becoming in the university environment as well. So, but of course the problem with breakout groups is that the teacher can only be with one of them at a time. So can we use AI partners to extend her ability to follow what's going on in these breakout groups and to facilitate these collaborative opportunities? NSF shares our vision to the extent that they've funded us as the first NSF Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Education. And we also realized right after we submitted the proposal last January that this is going to be just as important in remote learning environments as it is in classroom settings. Orchestrating breakout groups in, on Zoom, I think is even harder than it is in the classroom. We need a very transformative approach to thinking about artificial intelligence in educational settings. Most existing AI systems that are being used today for tutoring systems, or to monitor typed chats among students are only working with speech recognition or with text. Whereas we want our partner to observe and participate in and facilitate collaborative learning conversations by interacting naturally with the students using speech and gesture, gaze and facial expression. So multimodal and multi-party and to help the teachers orchestrate more effective collaborative learning experiences. So we believe that this, these breakout groups that provide these situated, authentic, collaborative activities will 
give the best environment for deep conceptual learning. We believe that the more we can develop collaborative problem solving skills and critical thinking skills in students, the more participation we'll have in the STEM workforce. And we also believe that meaningful learning experiences only occur when student voice inclusion, equity, and social justice are present. So we have to, like I said, rethink how we're going to use technology to support this. We also think that collaborative problem solving and critical thinking are amenable to artificial intelligence techniques and that the more naturally our AI partner can in interact with the students, the more engaged the students will be. So we're going to be developing several curriculum units during the process of our institute, and we've chosen AI as the primary topic for these curriculum units. So we're going to be using our AI partners to facilitate learning about artificial intelligence. Let me give you an example. We could have a curriculum unit on bias and AI algorithms. Imagine a virtual popcorn dispenser, and the students can request popcorn by saying popcorn, please. What they don't know is the speech recognition was trained mainly with high pitched voices and it doesn't do well when the older boys ask for popcorn. They rarely get their popcorn. We'll be using a collaboration framework called Academically Productive Talk and I'll tell you a little more about that in a minute. Uh, the skill we'll be developing is critical thinking. So our, this institute structure to support this vision is, has three separate research strands. Strand one is the one that is focused on the multimodal machine learning, the natural language processing, knowledge representation. I lead strand one, along with Ross Beveridge and Lynn Walker. Strand two is made up of learning scientists and they will be focusing on developing a new science for AI student teaming and giving us advice on how our AI partner can most effectively interact with the students. And strand three is the real key to the whole institute because um, it's led by Bill Penwell and Tammy Sumner and they have a long history of very successful collaborations with the Denver Public Schools and the St. Vrain School District so they are going to get us into the classroom. And perhaps more importantly, they're going to engage the teachers and the students and parents and other stakeholders at the very beginning. So we're going to be starting this in just a few weeks on what the vision should be of the AI partner in the classroom. This gives you um, a list of the different universities that are involved in the Institute. We have nine different universities. We had 29 um, faculty from those universities helping to write the proposal. Now adding graduate students and postdocs, we're up to more than 44. We cover 14 different research areas. And of course, critically, we have our K-12 partners in the school districts and also industry partners and affiliates. To say more about the research, so I've already talked about the three strands, the three different research strands. We, and the strand three is going to help orchestrate the learning futures workshops, which will be how we engage the entire community in developing our design for the AI partner and then how it's going to interact in the classrooms. And then of course, we wouldn't be able to do any of this if strand two wasn't going to be helping us set up um, pilot classroom environments in the laboratory where we can start testing out our AI partner and how it's interacting. At, and we will have planned two separate classroom field trials, one halfway through the Institute and the other at the end of the five years. And of course, lots and lots of evaluation and analysis of everything that we're doing and making everything open source that we can. Strand one, like I said, is for understanding the student conversations. And um, I'm the lead. I'm in computer science and linguistics. I've been collaborating happily with Jim Martin, 
who literally wrote the book on speech and language processing for almost 20 years now. And our focus has been more on content analysis and semantic representations. We very recently welcomed Katrina Khan as a brand new assistant professor at CU, who's also in natural language processing uh, with machine learning. So we've got the content analysis part of this, but we wouldn't dream of taking on this very, very ambitious autonomous conversational agent without Lynn Walker at UC Santa Cruz, who is a world expert on discourse analysis. And someone else from Penn Days, she and I were at the Institute for Research in Cognitive Science together some time ago. She's recently hired Jeff Flanagan, another NLP machine learning uh, assistant professor. And when I ran a four week summer workshop in Prague with Johns Hopkins, he was the star graduate student. So I'm thrilled to have a chance to work with Jeff again. And we have Alessandra Roncone at CU who works on human robot interaction, who will help us turn our conversational agent into something more real. For the multimodal analysis, we also have Ross Beveridge and Lynn and Ross are helping to lead the strand. And he and James Pusiewski together have developed an embodied avatar called Diana that completely transformed the DARPA Communicating with Computers program. And then finally, Jake Whitehill at WPI, who is an expert on facial expression detection. We all share the vision of this interactive AI partner that will be listening to, analyzing, and facilitating student conversations, promoting problem solving, and keeping the conversation focused. The dialogue management system will have to apply a control policy to decide when the AI partner should speak and what it should say when it does. So we're calling these talk moves. Talk moves come from the academically productive talk that I mentioned before, and they've been codified as effective ways for teachers to move conversations along and engage the students in the conversation. So there are things like revoicing, pressing for accuracy, keeping everyone together. These being able to make the right talk move choices will depend on having accurate, rich content analysis of student utterances and multimodal perception of the learning context. So for instance, having a shared perception of the learning context would allow the AI partner if the uh, two students are looking at this image of the girl holding the two balls and one of them points to the basketball, the AI partner should be able to perceive that gesture and align the pointing to the basketball with its representation of, I think this one will land first so that they, the AI partner knows it's the basketball she's talking about. Let me give you an example of how we want our agent to facilitate multi-party discussions. Remember the popcorn dispenser in our bias unit. So the students have been introduced to the popcorn dispenser. They've seen what happens when girls and boys ask popcorn, please, and they, they're supposed to talk about it. They start talking about popcorn, but then they go from popcorn to movies to Star Wars, as one does. And the next thing you know, they're fighting with imaginary lightsabers. At this point, we want our AI partner to have detected that they have gone a little bit off track and to produce a keeping everyone together talk move, like did all the kids who asked the popcorn dispenser for popcorn get it? In order to do that, in order to decide when to talk and what to say, like we need this control policy and we wanna use reinforcement learning for this. We're very, very fortunate that because of all the great work that Tammy and Bill have already been doing in classroom environments, that uh, Tammy has over 800 hours of transcripts of math teachers leading discussions on math topics in classroom settings. These have been transcribed and annotated with talk moves. So we've already trained classifiers on this data and now our idea is to use start with inverse reinforcement learning so that we can 
learn a reward function based on this training data that will mirror the, what we think is the teacher's motivation in choosing the talk move she chose when she was leading the classroom discussion. Once we have that reward function, then we can put it into our system with a hand-built initial control policy and use standard reinforcement learning in classroom settings and conversational settings to improve our conversational agent's ability to choose when to express certain talk moves. We can do other things with the reward function as well. We can use reward shaping. If we, if we notice that the system is starting to be biased in favor of more verbal students, we can use reward shaping to put a higher reward on engagement of all of the students. We can also build in fallback strategies in case the dialogue management or the speech recognition are not functioning. And as our learning scientists in strand two start to give us more fine grained advice on how to best interact with the students, we can build that into the reward function as well. We're going to need lots and lots and lots of training data. And we're also going to need this rich content analysis of the student and teacher utterances. So for this, we are going to make use of the very exciting language models such as BERT, Dialogue GPT, Roberta, and so on that are tr transforming the natural language processing field. We will have to tune them to the domains of our curriculum units uh, and others in STEM problem solving in general. But, and we also want to have a common semantic representation for the student and teacher utterances, for the lesson plans and the curricular content. We're choosing abstract meaning representations for that. We will have to be tuning to new curriculum units on an ongoing basis and also to different AI partner roles. So for that, we'll be relying on transfer learning and style transfer. This is a pipeline of what our content analysis process will look like. We'll start with either a student utterance or a teacher utterance and use our language models to produce vector, vector representations of, of what has been said. So if the student said the popcorn dispenser works less well for boys, this would be the vector representation. Using that vector representation and our AMR parser, we will then produce an abstract meaning representation, which is a structured knowledge graph that can indicate to us that this sentence is talking about a work event. The thing that is working is the popcorn dispenser. It's working for boys, but in a degree of less well. Once we have our symbolic knowledge graph, we can then vectorize that as well. And we can use the vector representation or the symbolic representation or both to feed into the dialogue management and the, our gen, natural language generation system in, for it to make the right choice as to what talk move, how to respond to what the student has said. One of the reasons we like abstract meaning representations is because in our DARPA programs, they've proven to be quite useful for handling co-references and implicit arguments. And we think they will help us align verbal and nonverbal signals. So if the student, instead of saying the popcorn dispenser, had pointed at a popcorn dispenser, then the, we read that gesture, we identify the image the student is pointing at, and then that image becomes the thing that is working exactly the same way that the phrase popcorn dispenser did. But we can do more with multimodal sensing than just detect gestures. We can use... Um, the work that Jake has done in detecting facial expressions and eye gaze is going to be crucial to being able to infer socio-cognitive effective states, group dynamics, and quality of interaction so that our system can tell the difference between a student who might say, I don't know, 
who's clearly unhappy and disengaged versus a student who would say the same thing, I don't know, but in a much more engaged way. So we've set ourselves quite a task. It's very daunting. It's multimodal, multi-party, multi-curricular. It involves real-time interaction. There's all kinds of risks in the failure of the dialogue management or the speech recognition, error accumulation, poor alignment of the signals. But we've, we're in a good starting place because we've got all of this annotated training data already available. We're finding as we interact more with our strand two scientists that they have wonderful videos of collaborative problem solving environments. And if once we get all the IRB set up, we're going to be able to start training our facial expression detection on those. Um, and we're, we have, we'll have all the advice and insights from the learning scientists in strands two and three. And for the reinforcement learning, we're gonna have access to huge amounts of classroom interaction time uh, in, in the school districts. And we also can start very conservatively. We can start with very simple interactions with just two students. We can only add more students, richer content analysis, nonverbal signals, and so on, as we feel comfortable doing that, as we feel confident that we have a robust system that will perform effectively in a classroom environment. And we'll be doing lots and lots of testing and piloting with the strand two scientists to determine that. And we'll be creating all kinds of novel algorithms for multi-party dialogue management, transfer learning, domain adaptation, multimodal affect recognition, alignment of verbal and nonverbal signals, real-time integrated speech and vision. So I said we can start conservatively. So we've, we've gotten far enough along now that we have sort of an idea of what that will mean. And our initial system that we will want to put in pilot classrooms to start the data collection process is something we think of as a sheepdog. It's really not going to be expected to say much. We don't expect it to be able to follow what's happening with the, the nuances of the conversation, but we do hope it would be able to detect if the students have gone really off topic and it would then execute a keeping everyone together talk mode. Once we've gotten enough data collected and we've been able to improve our dialogue management system, we hope to graduate to something we call a shepherd, which would be following, be more cognizant, more aware of what the student interactions are, still wouldn't be talking very much, but would be providing a little bit more guidance. And then our ultimate goal, and the, the shepherd is the one we want to have in our first real field trials halfway through the program. And then our ultimate goal is to have a proper guide who can follow the gist of most content-based conversation and respond appropriately. And that's what we want to have in the second field trial towards the end of the five years. So we so we these are our this is our level one proof of concept prototype, then level two for the first field trial halfway through, and level three for the second field trial. There are a lot of questions we have to answer along the process of creating these, this increasingly sophisticated agent or partner. What is the best role for it? Should, will the students interact with it more effectively if it's a mentee or a peer, just another student, or like a teacher's aide or even a teacher? And which one of those roles is going to put the least demands on the dialogue management system and be the most robust? What about the agent's persona? Is it, should it be just a disembodied voice like an Alexa or a talking head or an embodied avatar? Or do we really need actual physical robots? There is evidence that students engage much more happily with actual robots, but that they, pose a lot of physical challenges that we don't have with the other personas. And how accurate can we expect our content analysis or our motion detection to be? But perhaps the most serious questions are the ethical questions. One of the things that the teachers that we've already been interacting with are most interested in is something we're calling 
student and team diarization as the Even at the beginning, when we have just the sheepdog, as long as it's involved in the student conversation, it can be recording everything that's said and done and keeping track of it. And it can then do some analysis afterwards. It could in real time um, detect that maybe this group is really not doing very well. Maybe it's had to execute a couple of keeping everyone together talk moves. And it could raise a red flag right then and there for the teacher so that the teacher knows, well, this is the next group that I need to go and visit before I talk to anybody else. Or possibly if there's some kind of exciting insight, it could raise a green flag to say to the teacher, come hear about this. The whole class is gonna to wanna to hear about this. It would also be helpful to the teacher for the diary to include little snapshots about each individual student and how the student is interacting with the group. So how are we going to characterize that? Do we say that this student is a rude interrupter, that this other one is a passive observer, this one is disengaged, and this one is frequently off topic or inaccurate? But remember that we have very open classrooms these days. So the teacher may not be the only person reading this. The student themselves may see exactly how our little AI partner is characterizing it and their parents during parent-teacher meetings may see this all as well. So maybe we don't want to use language like this. Maybe we're going to need teachers and parents to help us define a very objective, non-judgmental set of terms that everyone would be comfortable with. One of the things that we're realizing now is how worried people are about having an AI partner in a classroom that is recording and keeping track of everything that the students say in here. It evokes people's worst nightmares of Big Brother is watching you in 1984 and Brave New World. And that's why it is so critical to engage the entire community, the, the parents, the teachers, the schools in envisioning exactly what this AI partner is going to be doing and recording and analyzing so that when we do put it in a classroom, there is enthusiasm and excitement about it instead of just fear. And we have other ethical questions as well. How equitably can our AI partner serve all students? How well does the speech recognition or the dialogue management or content analysis or emotion detection going to work with students who aren't native speakers of English, who have heavy accents? What if they have learning differences or speech disorders? What if it's, the student has recently experienced a family trauma and has been very affected by it or is brand new to the classroom and doesn't know anyone? How can we make sure that our AI partner will not be immediately biased against anyone who's a little bit different from the training data. It may be bitterly ironic that the curriculum example we used to help get the funding was on bias. So how are we going to handle this? Well, we're very, very grateful that we're not doing this all by ourselves, that we have strands two and strands three. And I have to say, all during the proposal writing, my idea was just, oh yeah, we need those classrooms because we're gonna use reinforcement learning. We need all of those interactions with the students for the reinforcement learning. And yeah, strand two is gonna help us set up pilot experiments and things. But I, it's only now that I'm beginning to appreciate just how critical having their involvement is and how impossible this task would be without them. Uh, this is the strand two involves a lot of um, uh, Leanne Hirschfield and Sadna Becker at UW-Madison are the leaders. Uh, and Leanne is a cognitive neuroscientist, uh, oops, sorry, who focuses on uh, neurophysical, physiological computing and as does Mikhail Carter. Clayton Lewis does human computer robot and robot interaction. And um, we also have Mike Tissenbaum, one of your colleagues at UIUC, and Jamie Gorman from Georgia Tech, uh, and then Peter and Sydney, 
at CU. Sidney DeMello is the PI for the whole institute. He's our fearless leader and is very much the bridge between the machine learning part, the learning science part, and the classroom part. The strand two is going to be de basically developing a new science for student AI teaming and giving us all kinds of insights into how the partner can most effectively engage. And it's also going to be providing support for setting up um, for the experimental design. So we have for uh, one crucial part of this is evaluation and hypothesis testing in the laboratory of different roles and personas for the AI partner before it goes into classrooms. And they'll be setting up Wizard of Oz studies with graduate students. They'll be bringing in a couple of freshmen to uh, emulate high school students and doing, we can do all kinds of pilots with them in this laboratory setting. But they also, with their neurophysiological computing, will be helping us to find metrics that can be used to actually measure how closely our automatic emotion detection systems are mirroring what's actually happening. They literally put EEG caps on the students and can keep track of brain scans while they're engaged in a particular activity. And then we can compare what's actually happening in the student's brain with the automatic classification the system is doing. So they're gonna be defining metrics that will allow us to actually measure the effectiveness of our socio-effective collaborative analysis. And then strand three, as I've already said, is our key to the classrooms. And it's mostly um, CU people, but with um, another Berkeley faculty member, Tom Phillip. And they're, they all have just an amazing depth of experience with doing everything from digital libraries to uh, physics tutoring systems, to teaching artificial intelligence to middle school students, and have this long track record of working with the Denver public schools. So, and this is where it's gonna be so important to include everyone involved, the youth, the parents, the educators, the community groups, the national groups in doing this co-visioning and co-developing of the appropriate role for this AI partner in the classroom. So that, like I said, when we actually are doing the field trials, this is not something the students and the parents are afraid of and upset about and are saying, I don't want my child anywhere near this thing. It's something that they welcome. The way to do that is going to be through these learning futures workshops when all of these people, these different potential participants are brought together with the Institute to do responsible innovation, to make sure that what we're doing is inclusive, that it anticipates problems, that it's responsive to the community. So that's it. Um, we think that the student AI teaming is going to make strategic impacts in at least six broad areas. One, of course, will be the foundational advances in the AI methods and the know-how for this multimodal, multi-party collaboration. Another will be this new science of student AI teaming. But we hope that putting the partner in the classroom will enhance these collaborative learning experiences for all of the students to a degree that it can really transform a STEM classroom into a knowledge building community. And that it can help develop a new generation of diverse AI workforce and AI leaders. We'll also be developing a very interdisciplinary research community like I said, we're at 44 already and growing and new research capacity. And we, with through the Learning Futures Workshops and the involvement of the community, we can serve as a national nexus point for co-designing AI te technology with diverse stakeholders. And this will allow us to realize our vision of promoting the deep conceptual learning using these breakout groups, these rich socio-collaborative learning experiences for all students effectively, both in-person and remotely. 
Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you so much, Martha. Um, while we, there's no questions yet in the chat, but I just want to ask you some questions of my own. Um, the, the inadvertent challenge in terms of bias and ethics that you discussed earlier just shows how difficult it is to avoid problems. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about about these issues, like advice you would give to other AI researchers about how to um, be aware in advance of things they might be creating, how to correct them, et cetera, et cetera. What, any kind of advice you want to give about these ethical pitfalls? Well, I think the my main advice is something I've kind of already said. So when we were doing the reverse site visit for NSF, and I had just presented, you know, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do reinforcement learning, we're going to use abstract meaning representations. And I was all excited about it. And uh, the NSF program manager actually said to me, well, you've clearly got uh, this great plan here and this fantastic team. Why shouldn't we just give you the money and let you go off and do your thing? And my answer was, fortunately, oh, no, no, we need strand two and strand three. But like I said, at the time, I was really seeing strand two and strand th three as being there more as my, um, uh, my hand servants who were going to give me access to the classroom so I could do the reinforcement learning. And what I realize now is that if we were to go off and do this all by ourselves and then you know, knock on the door of a classroom of a school district and say, hey, we've got this AI partner that we want to put into your classroom that's going to record and analyze everything your students say and do, just cold turkey, they would um, not even speak to me. They would kick me out immediately. So I think the, the main advice I can give you is that if you have an application that you want, you know, if you have a vision for how you think AI can better the world in a particular application, the first thing you do is go talk to the people that you think should be using this and involve them from day one in helping to design it. That this is not something that we can do in isolation based on our intuitions, that it really needs to be a community endeavor. Okay, great. Um, let's see, does anyone else have any questions? I have a question, Tandy. Great. Um, so this is slightly orthogonal to your talk, but um, in the context of remote education, remote learning, uh, what are some challenges? I mean, the, clearly there are challenges when you, when you have hands-on experiments or if you want to teach a lab uh, um, in, a, in a remote setting. Um, you know, what can AI help with that? I mean, I, I don't know what kind of challenges there are. I mean, this seems to be one of the biggest challenges for making things remote. And, and uh, have you thought about it? Are people in your institute, are they thinking about it? Yeah. So one of our, um, there's a curriculum unit that our educators have, have already developed that's being used in the Denver schools on uh, sensor units. It's, you know, so it shows, you know, how you can measure temperature and, um, dampness and a couple of other things. And it's, so it's really works perfectly as part of our AI curriculum. And the unit is set up to be used in the classroom where the students actually have hands-on experience with these sensor units. And the, it's been a real challenge to try to move that into a remote learning environment. So of course, one way to do it, and the, the way that most of the classrooms have chosen is that they just simulated everything. So now the students are working with simulated sensor units. Um, and, and certainly you can use you know, all kinds of modeling and artificial intelligence to simulate things. Um, another teacher actually drove to student houses to deliver units to the students, the physical units, so that they, and then they had to sort of, one student would have one piece of it and another student would have a different piece and they would have to coordinate over in their breakout group over Zoom in order to put all, you know, put everything together to put all the pieces of information together. Um, other than simulations, I don't know that AI has any magic key to transferring activities to Zoom. Thank you. 
Great, thank you so much. Very, very interesting talk and important issues for us to be thinking about.